Hey everybody, uh, welcome to this Hyperverse uh, AMA live stream. I have with me uh, today uh, Seb Alberini of Future Trash. I'm Nick Kalyani, uh, founder of uh, Decentology, the platform behind Hyperverse. I'm so excited today. Uh, Seb uh, is uh, a, a great gamer and he's, what he's going to talk about today is just simply amazing. It's a great collaboration between our two companies. So Seb, welcome. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing, Nick? Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing very well. And I cannot wait to share all the amazing things that we've been uh, talking about and you've been showing me with, with the world. It's, it's just uh, fantastic. So why don't we just uh, dive right uh, into it? Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself? Yeah, totally. Well, I'm Seb. I'm a game director and one of the founding members of Future Trash, which is actually the studio we're announcing today. We're announcing the uh, kind of creation of today. And our project uh, in question is called Fode. And uh, I have a development background. I've been building games in C++ for the better, the better part of 10 years now. And really, really excited to show our first kind of dive into the Web3 space with Fode. So yeah, uh, I guess well, we can just hop right in if you don't mind. Well, actually, first, I'm really curious about that chair back there. What's, what's, what's the oh, situation boy. there? <laughs> this guy? Yeah. Yeah, that's a racing simulator that I built actually recently. And you, you built that? I did. That's cool. Uh, it's constructed of like, you know, you get to pick your favorite part. So from the pedals to the shifter to the actual wheel and all that, you kind of get to uh, pick your favorite parts and then you put it together. I actually had a couple of friends come over to help me. So a couple of beers later, we had this thing up and running and the chair moves and everything. It's pretty, pretty sweet. Wow. That's incredible. Now, you know, I, I visited you in LA uh, a few months back. And one thing I noticed is that you have an obsession with, with cars. So can, tell us a little bit about that. What's, what's, what's going on there? Yeah, man. Uh, I was raised driving a stick shift. Uh, my dad is a huge car enthusiast, so shout out to Carlos. He uh, raised me right, so he showed me cars from a pretty early age, and I learned how to drive my first car, like stalling out in the middle of an intersection, and uh, fell in love instantly. And so to this day, I kind of have a collection of mostly broken old stick shifts that I love uh, driving around. You caught me in one of those <laughs> red hand. Wow, cool. And I saw you perform uh, and you were killing it tell us more about that you're too kind i don't know if i was killing it but yeah uh yeah you came to la and we actually happened to have a show that night so shout out to jacob dennis we're in a band uh it's definitely like a hobbyist kind of approach by no means are we professionals but we uh packed out the viper room in los angeles and nick was fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to kind of get in the mosh pit with us that night so that was fun yeah it was definitely awesome i really liked it <laughs> All right, now that we know a little bit more about Seb uh, in your personal life, let's get into what you're doing here with uh, the, the game. Talk to us about Fode. What was the inspiration behind it? How did you get started with it? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, can we get my screen share up? And I can happily walk you through that. Everyone can see this, yeah? Yeah. Nick? Cool. Yes, yes. So this is Fode. You said to make it scrappy. So this is kind of as scrappy as it gets presentation-wise. But uh, Fode actually was first and foremost created... Uh, by two of our founding members as a solution to a problem that we saw in the Web3 industry, which was that as we had these 3D models and NFT drops kind of coming about after the pixel art craze, we kind of moved into these highly rendered pieces of artwork. And we found that the turnover rate for actually producing that art was pretty lengthy and pretty cumbersome because, you know, you'd talk to, you'd outsource to a studio, the studio would generate the art, we would take forever to render. And you know you have this end-to-end -end latency, so to speak, of getting these things generated. And so a uh, very clever technical artist on our team, shout out to Nate, he thought of a way to kind of make modular procedural art within Unreal Engine 5. And that kind of cuts down that entire process by which you have to render things out. Because Unreal is very good at cranking out visuals just like this in real time on the fly, and we can produce hundreds of thousands of these things in real time. So Seb, let me interrupt you. You used a long phrase there. Can you break that down for us, please? Oh, the, pr the procedural part? Yes. Okay, yeah. So basically, these are FODs. They're fun anthropomorphized grenades. And they're built up of a ton of components. They, everything from the handle material, the actual FOD body type, uh, the keychain that you see here, the stickers, the face, basically upwards of 15 uh, attributes that build these things up. Nate devised a system that basically builds these things, builds these from scratch, <clears throat> excuse me, in real time and basically enables us to pump out these designs on, on the fly. And they mostly look pretty good, right? 
So instead of sitting there and kind of awesome. handcrafting these models, we're able to pump these things out uh, in the tens of thousands. And they're game ready, which is the best part. So this is built directly in Unreal 5. Um, we will dive into the actual engine footage in a bit here, but wow, Unreal 5, amazing. yeah, it's pretty, pretty potent stuff. But yeah, so we came up with this tool and this IP of these really fun, goofy, destruction, chaos fueled grenades uh, became the IP that was the proof of concept for that, what would have been a PFP project. But that very quickly transitioned. And we, well, as soon as we saw these guys, we wanted to drop them into a game. And so what started as a PFP project actually very quickly developed into what we consider a lifestyle brand at this point. So, you know, everything here, all the little details and the more explicit bits are very much the cultural representation of Fode. Um, and so, yeah, we're really, really excited to kind of unveil this. This is actually our first kind of stepping stone in terms of in terms of having like a outward facing unveiling of the actual Fode project. So really, really excited to show you guys this stuff today. Cool. So maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, the the game itself and the gameplay and the mechanics of that. Can you walk us through some of that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start by saying that um, this is actually per Nick's request here from the beginning of our partnership. I think you made it really clear that we want to build in public and not shy away from kind of showing game footage and showing off things, even if they are premature or underdeveloped. And I think that what we become very accustomed to, in the, especially at the height of this bull run, was a bunch of projects that were selling you NFTs and making you promises and even selling you tokens, but never actually showing anything for it. And a lot of those games, I can promise you right now, will never come out. And so instead of following that same kind of script, we want to flip that on its head and start with the gameplay before we sell you a single NFT or we convince you that, you know, our project is worth your time or your consideration. We are going to start with the gameplay and really go from there. And so in spirit of uh, your suggestion, we are building in public. And this is completely, this is three months of full-time development. So I'm not trying to disclaim it, but by no means is this finished. I would say this is like 70% of the way toward our final look. But yeah, wow. we really just want to wow. show off this, what we've been working on. This is so cool. Yeah. So this is a photo in real time. And uh, I talked about how we were able to create these things on the fly and kind of generate them indefinitely. So as an example of that, I can just sit here all day and generate new phones. And it'll use that procedural system. And they all look pretty sweet, at least in my opinion. So everything from the stickers to the shoes, to the keychain, to the handle material, the facial expressions, everything is procedural and it's pulling obviously from a pool of attributes and you get, you'll never get two of the same phones. Yeah, so, so Seb, uh, like this is so mind blowing. I have to ask the question. Uh, this is a standalone app, is it? It's funny you ask. So. This is actually gonna be a full browser game. And we are building these assets and the systems in place using Unreal 5 to be able to play this in browser and it will be platform agnostic. So it'll be utilizing some type of cloud computing. Wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> we'll, sorry, it'll be on This is that. all gonna be in the browser in real time. Yes, sir. How, that is mind blowing. Like how, Unreal how 5, is it possible? It's just, Unreal 5 is really making us look better than we are as developers, but uh, so basically Unreal 5 kind of rolled out with a pixel streaming inherent to the design where it's actually built in and you're able to basically set up an AWS server, spool up a server and be able to actually have cloud computing on the server and all you need uh, as the end user is a decent Wi-Fi connection and it'll look like this. Wow. Um, platform agnostic and that also includes mobile. So your, your graphics card, your computer, you don't need like some Titan rig to be able to run this game. Um, but yeah, I would love to walk through kind of like what the actual mechanics are here and what this, you know, this kind of captures the feel and the look of the Fode world that we're trying to build. But at the end of the day, there needs to be gameplay, right? Um, I think that's also too sparse in this industry so far where there's actual fun game loops to be had. And so basically what we're planning here is what we like to call Fall Guys on steroids. Have you heard of Fall Guys, Nick? I have not, but I'm not a gamer, so don't hold that against me. Okay, that's all good. Fall Guys uh, actually had a recent resurgence. It is a free-to-play game now. It is basically a party game, series of mini games where you load a bunch of players onto a server and you have like a battle royale system. Through a series of mini games, you wow. parse out the, the, you know, if you do well, you make it to the next stage. If you do well, you make it to the next stage. Eventually there's one man left standing and that's, or one woman left standing and that is the battle royale kind of model, right? But it's centered around these mini games. And so we want to build Fall Guys on steroids because it is a very successful play model. Uh, the, the game sold over a million copies uh, to this day, and we really love what they did, and it's a point of inspiration for us. However, 
we want to turn that on its head and kind of build fall guys but centered around the ability to explode right because you are a grenade after all so i can yeah. run around this map uh things are destructible fully destructible um and you can kind of see the collateral damage you can cause here but effectively we want to build a battle royale system with a bunch of mini games all centered around this destruction mechanic so let's say we load 40 44 sorry 40 foes onto a server right and uh that basically is the starting match and the, fir the first map the win condition might be let's blow up the entire map right uh and so we're all running around we're jockeying for position i'm i'm you know there's at, the, at its core this is a 3d platformer so you're gonna be jockeying for position and trying to find the biggest points of interest to you to kind of unleash your explosion and rack up destruction points right um so let's say this bank is like uh, it's glowing it's glowing red like it, i know this is valuable it's a high value target i'm gonna get over there as soon as i can blow it up and get all those destruction points racked up and so once the map is fully destroyed let's say it's like a, we want to aim for like a casual five minute game experience uh if i place in the top half of that i make it to the next mini game and so the way the map is constructed is going to be utilizing a lot of procedural elements as well i keep saying procedural so just to clarify what i mean by that it's like using a system to build the thing in real time as opposed to having like a hard-coded level so like okay. super mario has hard-coded levels but super mario run on the mobile system is based on procedural uh, algorithms it's basically building a level out in real time so we really want to take advantage of that it basically creates a new refreshing play space every time you play the game so you'll never see the same map twice you'll never see the same foes twice and we really want to keep those win conditions and the mini games fresh and fun wow i all of this is happening in the browser. I'm just looking at the the effects, you know, when the explosions happen, and it's it's un un unreal, <laughs> you know. It's yeah, uh, and and uh, I'm just imagine like you've got you know one foe going along there, but you have like five or ten of these, and the explosions. It's gonna be mayhem. Uh, there. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, thankfully, because of the cloud computing setup, all of that stuff is happening on the server, and we're just streaming you the data. So it's not like my graphics card will be responsible for having all these explosions happening okay. at once. You know, we just kind of get to make things pretty and uh, yeah, it's going to be really fun to make. So you can see down here, this is kind of like one of our little narrative elements that we're trying to build around. So because it is a still web three game, you know, you're going to need to have like your staking and you know, those, those types of blockchain centric uh, activities and mechanics, but we don't want to just have them be like point and click interfaces. We want to have like narrative elements. So down here, we're planning the space as kind of like the FODE acid vat, where I'm able to stake tokens down here and potentially get FODE parts out of the acid vat. But it's still draped in this kind of fun narrative uh, encasement, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I, always, I love it. Everything's got to be narrative, right? Yeah, it's instead of using a direct UI, you have like me metaphors that, that are in context of the game. Mm -hmm. So you don't get out of the immersive game environment. I think that's that's pretty, pretty, pretty freaking cool. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you, you've talked a little bit about the gameplay and the game mechanics and all that, and you've mentioned a little bit about Web3. So let me step back first and ask you, like, why even bother to have any Web3 angle to it before we get into the how part of it? Super valid question. And I think that if we weren't able to answer that as like a game studio or as a team, it really beckons the question of like, why not just a Web2 game, right? Yeah. It's so why Web3. And I, I think there's... There's a ton of answers and there's probably ones that people have heard already where it's just like you really want to own your assets right and so if all things were equal and we were we could play the same games we play today in mass such as warzone uh you know uh apex legends PUBG, except you know everything's the same except all the skins you buy are transferable and in a wallet i think most people would take that deal if everything else is the same right so there's a natural I think gravitation toward actually owning those assets and instead of having a bunch of skins sitting on a game that you spent six months playing and then never thought about again there is something to be at least transferred after the fact right you can kind of recoup your investment or move those assets into something that you're now interested in so there's something there but beyond that i think that there's a much bigger question at hand which is like how does web3 allow us to bring in new game experiences that aren't available on web2 and so for me uh, for example, in FODE, we're going to have a, a ranked mode where you're able to kind of ante up tokens and risk monetary value uh, in with the, with the expectation that the level of skill and the competition will, will obviously raise with that. But then I can take the heap. So we all ante up five tokens, let's say, and I take the I take the whole thing if I win the thing, if I win the game or I take, you know, I can break even if I place in the top 10. So like for me as a gamer, 
if I could play Warzone right now and everything else is the same, except I get to ante up $100 before the game starts and take uh, take the whole stack if I win that game, like that just makes Warzone more fun. I would take that deal right now, right? Um, but for the masses, there's the obvious ownership. There's there's a huge amount of effort we put into building these NFTs up in terms of like making them customizable. So all of those attributes that I mentioned, upwards of 15, um, you're going to be unlocking and leveling, leveling up your FODE and unlocking these attributes. And those attributes are actually dynamic. So you can speak more about this later in the smart contract, but I don't know what attributes I will have available to my FODE until I've leveled them up from zero to 100. And so there's a perpetual unboxing experience there. And it really offers a level of authorship to each person's FODE that I don't think is achievable in any other context. So again, there the, the technology is supporting like a new game experience because what we find is that people are extremely proud of their in-game achievements and they wear these badges of honor so proudly, whether it's the way you build up your gun in Warzone or the skin that you got from season one of uh, Fortnite or, you know, your oddball build in Elden Ring. There's always something really fun and engaging and players love showing that stuff off. And this just adds another layer of, of customization and authorship to those same assets that you're otherwise interacting with. And so... You know, a lot of people are very anti in the, especially the core gamers. And that's at par for the course with any disruptive space. But we really do believe that uh, we're onto something here and that this is like another level of engagement using the technology. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to, to kind of speak about this in sort of Web3 language a little bit, what you're talking about here is that the uh, FODs are essentially uh, NFTs and... Mm -hmm you would have the ability to, when when you are ready and, and you want to uh, move on, you could potentially transfer them to someone else, whether through a marketplace or directly, therefore opening up the game in, in a multitude of, of ways. So th this actually also presents the very alluring possibility of uh, if there is co cooperation between game studios moving assets intelligently between games in the future yeah absolutely i think that as this burgeoning space kind of takes takes more shape and becomes more intuitive for the end user and probably more consumed in mass it only makes sense that these games start combining forces and make it so like hey this transferability is like prime for not only user generated content but like cross game compatibility and so a great example of that actually not in web3 but a game that just came out multiverses which is like absolutely taking the industry by storm right now it's just a cross breed of all of Warner Bros IP and people are going crazy for it because wow. it's just it just opens up the door for for like this creative creativity and kind of these new experiences because it's like oh I like this game I like this game they're both on ETH or they're both on Polygon let's let's make a collaboration piece here let's make these things uh work together why not right it's a really really yeah, awesome process absolutely yeah so so Seb you know uh our, our teams have spent a lot of time kind of talking about the the back end aspect of it the blockchain aspect of it and I want to spend a little bit of time kind of helping uh, game developers who are just sort of getting into Web3 understand what we are doing and how we're going to approach it. So this is where I want to tell a little bit about the, the Hyperverse. Um, so the Hyperverse is uh, an open, uh, decentralized, you can call it a marketplace uh, for, uh, for on-chain smart contracts. We call them smart modules because they are very modular. And the idea here is that for web devs in particular or game devs, uh, we want to create an experience where they don't have to know all this backend blockchain stuff, like learn new languages like Solidity or Cadence, Rust, etc. And what we do is we have these modular smart contracts and we provide a JavaScript abstraction layer. So as a web developer, you work with that JavaScript layer and you know you create your beautiful game uh, graphics, your game mechanics, etc. And you don't have to worry about how does the transaction work? What is the wallet connection uh, scenario and all of those kind of problems that you would otherwise have to uh, think of. So uh, when I look at this game and what you're showing here, it's very clear that uh, as a game developer, you know, there is, there is value being created here. And the value is in the thought you have put into the game mechanics, the, the user experience for the, for the, for the gamer. And of course, all the, the, the visually stunning, or as one commenter said, Unreal uh, experience. 
you know so uh but there's the other part of the game which is the value about that comes on the blockchain the smart contract piece of it how is how are these assets tracked how are they stored um ordinarily if you were to go to like a marketplace like OpenSea or Foundation, et cetera, and get an asset, that experience is super boring. Uh, here, we're going to create a really great experience for, for the user. And the way we, we're going to make it possible is by having a real tight coupling uh, with the front end and the back end. But the Hyperverse provides all that abstraction. So as game developers, you basically have given us direction on, you know, like this is kind of what we want to do. And what the, the, our team has done is essentially abstract that into these smart modules. And, and here, here's where, uh, you know, it gets really exciting. When you started off, you talked about how we want to do this in the open. It's a new kind of way, right? So not only are we talking about doing development in open, but we are also making it so those smart modules that are the core of these are available to other game devs. So they can, in turn, come up with their own mechanics, their own... Uh, user experience and just build quickly off it. So I think that is that is both novel and re revolutionary. And I'm just super excited. And actually, I'm very grateful that we are having this collaboration because I think it's going to make it possible for many, many, many game devs to achieve their goals of having a, a shipping game, you know, publish a game without as much effort. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't speak enough about how how nice it's been to be able to work with you guys and because we are web 2 developers first and foremost and we are transitioning to this space and just having the wherewithal and the ability to even make like airtight immutable code that we can rely upon and other developers can then rely upon into the foreseeable future i think is super invaluable because as a developer from like myself we come on board you know we might have someone learn solidity but at the end of the day um if we can focus on the stuff that makes games really fun like this and then rely on you guys or rely on existing code that is scalable to actually like, you know, do something simple like authorize, authorization of the ownership of an NFT or transference of said assets to wallet after the game is over. Those types of uh, loops and like the seamlessness with which with which you guys are providing it for us, it just makes everything so much faster and easier. It's incredible. Yeah, that's cool. Falfonso says that's super cool bomb. And yeah, it's like super cool. I'm just <laughs> really excited about it. Uh, all right, so let's uh, talk a little bit about where we are in the development cycle here and uh, what the plan is, uh, what's the roadmap. Let's get into that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as as many people in the space are kind of withholding NFT drops right now due to like market volatility and just the fact that it's a little bit scary, a lot of people got burned, right, uh, in the last few months. And so dropping some giant NFT drop without utility, I would view as a very risky kind of approach. So we are full heads down on building this game out and we're on track for a season one launch of uh, quarter one next year. We're moving very quickly. We have a small team, but a very potent team. And you know, we can crank out assets and, and gameplay relatively quickly. This is two and a half months of full-time development, most of which went into the art. So I feel like we're moving very quickly. We're on pace, uh, but we might just time it where the NFT drop comes out with the game and it's all native to the app, you know, hop in on Fode, play a few games for free. And then if you decide you want to be an NFT holder, it will be very approachable. We're never going to have the Axie problem. We're avoiding all of that. Uh, the the price of each NFT will actually be on the US dollar conversion. So it will always be an approachable game space. And we really want to make it as easy as possible to get into the door. But yeah, schedule wise, we're looking at quarter one next year to be able to play like season one of Fode. Now, um, you know, we've talked about the NFT and earlier you you hinted at staking, etc. So what's mm. that angle there? Are, are there other layers of to tokenization that this game is going to have? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, we, you know, we don't want to go too, too crazy in detail on the token because yeah. these things are in flux. And quite frankly, no one's figured out like the perfect model yet. Right. We're all just trying to improve on the last iteration. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, because this is Web3, we get to take advantage of things like this where, hey, um, I want to passively stake my phone and get turn rewards or structural rewards as a result of that, right? And so whether it's in the phone asset vat where you're staking an actual token to get parts or you're staking your phone itself and offering it to the phone bot army, uh, there are reward structures in place for those types of loops as well. And so, you know, as any game, when it launches, you need to have some type of AI to fill games, especially in the Web3 space where you know, a large player base in Web3 is like 
2000 to 10,000 DAU and what or in web two, it's like, that's nothing like, you know, but we're in a very new space here. And so as these things are kind of emerging, I think it's important to have AI. And we thought what, a, what more fun way to establish AI than staking your phone and offering it to the bot army uh, for rewards. If you're not necessarily someone who wants to play the game, you're not a gamer, but you like the brand, you like the IP and you want to be involved, you can own a phone, stake it to the bot army, right? So we're just offering a bunch of fun kind of options for all walks of life and trying to cast as wide a net as possible. Yeah, uh, Oleski says so crazy eyes and you know, like I I've just looked at some of the art and all the different uh, personality traits and all that. And they are like so, so awesome, you know, you, like so creative and, and so, so, so in interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, Appreciate so, that. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. Uh, uh, before we, we leave that, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the uh, actual innovation that is there around the attributes and you know we talked a little bit about leveling up uh etc so um you know it, it took quite quite a bit of engineering but we've got this going on on the smart contract where essentially uh, what we have is that each time you level up a different set of choices uh for uh, attributes visual attributes uh become available to you so talk a little bit more about how you came up with that idea and where you know like what's the genesis of this absolutely yeah um kind of hard i kind of touched on this earlier but i really think that without utility uh all future nft drops will kind of get swallowed up by other nft drops with like genuine utility right and so yeah. we wanted to take that and just run with it all the way so like utility for days if you will like we want you to be able to get a phone and and be incentivized to own and take care of it and play the game with it because of this super uh, deep kind of customization that we're building around these things. And so you and I personally worked very hard on this. We came up with a structure where uh, this is a wireframe, by the way, very rough. But if I, you know, it'll scan my wallet. These are all the phones I own. Let's say I want to customize Hellbound Daddy right now and I want to like make some changes to my phone. So I'll go here, hit the craft button. And here you can kind of see uh, you know, these are all the kind of attributes we talked about. So the material body, which is like the texture of this phone, the material handle, which is the texture of this handle, uh, the keychain sticker, so on and so forth. But you can see that these are locked behind levels. Um, and so I actually have to play with my phone and complete quests or daily activities or just play play matches with my phone to unveil these uh, attributes. And so until I get to level five, I don't know what this might hold. And for all I know, maybe my common phone actually has a super uncommon attribute at level 25 and i don't know that until i get there right and so i think you can talk to this about how you achieve this but there actually is true randomness there right yes there's definitely true randomness and uh i just wanted to highlight that this ui is 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 beautiful but it is actually backed up by a real smart contract and so doing that uh is by itself uh qu quite an achievement I'm, I'm very excited about it and so yeah what we needed to do in this here is make it possible to achieve uh, uh randomness without relying uh on an external oracle uh and things like that so uh it, it's it's been crazy but i think we are we are we are there absolutely and i think it's with it's worth noting that there's a lot of care taken with these things because let's say these things aren't truly random and you could kind of reverse engineer that smart contract and that isn't airtight. Now you have a gamified system and yeah. you know, it blows up your whole rarity scale and it just kind of blows up the whole novelty of it. Right. So yeah. airtight code is very important there. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it needs, we, we, we can't have it where someone who, you know, we can't have it like, for example, in the client side where someone can just go and reverse engineer it and look at it and like, Oh, okay. Yeah, and just, absolutely uh, not. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, more more to the the specific specifics of what you can do here is so i can go to my sticker slot here and it'll scan my wallet for the stickers i own so the stickers are actually composite so they are actually their own nfts and they are mm. applicable to any phone if the phone meets the level requirement for that sticker right so whereas the material body that we were on before is inherent to the phone and not transferable amongst phones this is the what, what is available to this phone these stickers are actually available to all phones right and so one, we think this is an awesome opportunity for user generated content and artist collaborations because effectively anyone can pump out a series of PNGs and we can immediately transfer that to game data and be able to paste these things across phones. So we love this open ended kind of UGC option here. Uh, also guild integration worth noting. So if anyone's here familiar with the, the, the Web3 guilds, you know, uh, 
you could rock a YGG or your favorite guild sticker as you play these games and get potentially uh, token rewards as, as a result of that. But so I'm not level 10 yet, so I can't equip Sweet Death, but I am high enough level for Alien. So I can see what that looks like on my phone, hit the craft button, get details about, you know, what that will, how that will affect the phone, craft it, play a fun little mini game where I smash my phone in the, over the head with a hammer while we craft this beautiful sticker and voila, that sticker is on there. Damn. Nice. Uh, and it should be noted that what you've just demonstrated there is essentially a composite NFT. It's an NFT that consists of, of other NFTs. And those uh, NFTs, those stickers can be yanked and transferred to someone. They can be sold or you can just swap them out, etc. And I think uh, that is also something very novel and interesting that you can sell an NFT as a composite, the whole food or you can sell or transfer it uh, as individual things there. So yeah. there is a, a question from Mediocre Chili. Uh, does utility also mean FODs will be transferable to future FOD titles? Oh, absolutely. I think that's par for the course in this space, right? Uh, well, let it be known though, we do plan and we have every ambition in the world to build this game out for a long time coming. I think, you know, whether it's this FOD exact title as it sits with the PVP Battle Royale or something broader uh these assets will absolutely live on in the FOD universe indefinitely and we plan and have every ambition of supporting them in, well into the future so transferability is is like an absolute non-starter if, if we ever if there's ever a FOD sequel you better bet that you can take this guy in there as well right yeah absolutely blowing up stuff is never gonna go out of style <laughs> in, games, in games in games <laughs> just to cl absolutely. clarify that yeah <laughs> solid yeah. clarification um also worth noting though what's really cool on the server or on the game side of stuff we basically have an ability to create this phone right which is like this very complex set of variables and parameters and recreate it in engine in real time with just an identifier so no matter where you place this sticker and no matter what craziness you've done to your phone whether it's like an insane iced out hot dog keychain or some crazy pink shoes no matter where you hop in it'll be able to render that way in real time as it would be transferred on the market or otherwise if that makes sense so wow. keeping everything real time is pretty important to us as well that is that is just amazing you know um just looking at what you've demonstrated here uh it, it i actually agree with with uh, kevin it's like explosions like you know big big time uh <laughs> amazing stuff so give us some insights into how, your team and how how you go about you know building this uh, i'm sure our audience would like to know you know what goes into creating a game like this absolutely um we are very fortunate to be surrounded i can speak for kevin and myself uh, we are two of the co-founders as well but we are surrounded by some of the most talented people i've ever personally worked with and i just feel really lucky every day like our technical artist our lead designer um everything the, our, our guys doing particle effects we have a really talented team and we, we do feel with, with utmost confidence that our art and the IP and the branding is very, very strong. And they think that that's our strong suit. But uh, as a day to day, it is really a very small team. There's six of us working on this full time right now. And we've cranked out I, I what I think is uh, pretty solid progress in two months and two and a half months. Uh, but the day to day is basically mostly just making jokes in Slack and, uh, you know, sharing fun stuff that we're all working on. We're all very, pretty resourceful. I've even broken out the coding gloves for this one and tried to contribute to the, as best I can, uh, which I haven't done in like almost two years now. So coming out of retirement for this one. But uh, yeah, it's a really fun, small group. Uh, we plan on scaling up as needed, but never before that point. Right. And uh, keeping things tight and keeping it, you know, trying to do a small team, big splash kind of approach. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, I absolutely love what you're doing here. The game is amazing and uh, it's something that I want to play. And, you know, it's actually the first time i'm like uh, seeing a game that i'm like okay it, it's it's simple exciting and immersive and engaging and it's uh i think it's going to be very very successful and what's more what's more is because of the the fact that we're doing this in the open and we have the modular architecture on the back end it will inspire i feel other developers to also jump into the space and we should uh, really see much more uh, creativity uh, in this and, and I'm excited about that because uh, the more we, we desperately need to simplify the user experience in Web3 
so more users can understand what it's about and understand its power and, and beauty. And, you know, just simple things like how the wallet integration works and doesn't take you out to some dialogue or something like that. You know, th those are the kinds of little touches that, that make, make a big difference. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's going to matter quite a bit. Uh, so John here asks, what's most exciting about building on blockchain for game developers? Oh, I can answer that for sure. So I actually think there's kind of a funny phenomenon happening where in Web2, specifically as it relates to like competitive shooters and, and competitive multiplayer games that are played in mass, we've had like a pretty stale market for about four years now. So that being said, uh, what I mean by that is that the same games that were popular four years ago are popular today. Mm -hmm. And they basically just keep rolling out new seasons, new skins, new characters. Uh, and I really think there's an obvious reason for that. And the fact is, it is so expensive to build a Web2 game. And you have these inflated kind of entry level pr uh, to get in. It's just so expensive for small developers that it's not worth it unless you kill it. And, you know, to actually compete with these big dogs like Warzone, Apex Legends, these huge games, you need to have like an absolutely viral hit, smash hit, right? To even recoup your investment. And so it's scary for smaller developers to kind of make creative new IP. And that's kind of why it's stagnated right now. It's a kind of a stagnant market and there's nothing new and fun to play. So from my perspective as a smaller development team, we are in a space where creativity and doing something new and different is like warranted and absolutely necessary for the industry to move forward. And so to even play a small, you know, molecular role in that transition is just such a fun kind of emergent space. And we're just really excited to be able to do something creative and new that hasn't been done before. And because it's, you know, Web3, we don't, we don't necessarily have to have 200 million players to make a splash you know we can you know this is a, a, a new space and it isn't we don't have this massive uptake of, of new users but we would love to be part of that process where we get to that point right and make it more intuitive like you said and make absolutely. onboarding easy absolutely and you know like you're blazing a new trail here and you're making it possible for uh indie developers who don't have massive budgets or you know or even if they're just getting started to get into the space and really find success very quickly. So Mehrab asks, which blockchain platform this game is building on? Uh, so uh, I, I can actually feel that one. So one of the, the interesting things here is that we are at a point right now where uh, we have obviously well-established platforms like uh, Ethereum, but there's also uh, other L1 and L2 uh, contenders. So uh, right now we are going through the process of uh, really evaluating uh, exactly which uh, protocol is best and most responsive and lowest in terms of, of gas. So uh, we, we are figuring that out and uh, we have a few contenders uh, right now, but in the but since this video is going to be long lived, I'd rather just uh, wait until we have made a decision uh, before we kind of talk about that. But uh, mo more than likely, it will be uh, on, on a platform that is fast, uh, cost efficient from a gas uh, standpoint, uh, and yet uh, has an already established a footprint or is on its way to establishing a footprint. So, uh, so Seb, uh, uh, we've, we've talked about the game. We've talked about the roadmap. We've talked about your, your team. Uh, let's talk a little bit about like, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if there are developers out there or people who are interested in sort of working with you at the alpha, the beta stage, et cetera, where do they go? How do they connect with your team and, and start participating in, you know, build, in, in playing Fode and giving you feedback? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, we, have a, I, uh, we have a Discord that we just started. I absolutely implore everyone here, whether you're watching it live or retroactively, please come, come say hi and take part in this journey as we kind of build out these playables and do very public play tests and kind of build absolutely everything in the open. Um, that's a double-edged sword, right? Obviously, you don't want uh, too many cooks in the kitchen. However, we do truly believe in marketing uh, with a community in mind and, and building this thing out with the community in mind. We also have a live Twitter for the Future Trash uh, actual studio. So just drop by there for updates. And then, yeah, the Discord and, the Discord and Twitter are both up and running. And we plan to have playables uh, and a closed beta within the next two and a half months. And if you want to be part of that, we will have signups through those uh, mediums that I just mentioned. Awesome. 
Well, I, this was a very, very exciting uh, conversation. Uh, learned a lot here myself, even though I've been working with you, some new stuff here. Uh, and, you know, we're going to do this again. And we're going to do this with other members of your team, other members of the Hyperverse uh, team. Uh, and uh, we're going to regularly give updates and, uh, you know, get feedback from people and make sure that we build the most kick-ass, the most awesome uh, game experience uh, possible for people out there. So uh, any closing remarks, Seb? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for taking the time. We are super excited to be working together and I couldn't be more grateful for the opportunity here. Yeah, uh, me too. I, I think your uh, this is a great collaboration. Your team is exciting to work with and this is very novel. And I think uh, we're going to uh, open up some, some doors for other developers and that really excites me. So uh, thank you so much for uh, thank you, Nick. joining me. And thanks to everyone who uh, joined us live and who are watching this uh, uh, recorded. Uh, have a great day and uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. See you guys.